Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, we're back for another Fireside Chat, and it's uh, been a non-memorable week with only one game this week. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt, and we're joined today with a special guest, longtime friend of the show, uh, Mike Gold. Mike, you probably know from the Heat Beat, his website. He uh, writes about the Heat this year on Flames Nation, <laughs> and he wants us to remind you that you may have heard him on Fan 960, if you're still listening to Fan 960 outside of game time. So, Mike, thanks for joining us. Oh, I'm I'm really glad you threw in the plug to the 960 hits. That was a lot of fun. Uh, I got. I thank, bet. Got to thank Ryan Pinder and Pat Steinberg for that. Great guys. How did that come about? Um, you know, I was talking to Pat because Pat does some stuff with uh, the 962. Um, he had had me on his show. I well, I had I had done some call-ins on overtime um, uh, a few times during the season, and that was before you know the whole Jeff Ward thing when when he was let go and. You know, I was just saying. So Matt, there is one rational guy who calls into overtime. Even <laughs> what, to meet what him. they're not all drunk? <laughs> it's it's a crazy show. Like I do not envy Pat um, because he has to put up with a lot of stuff. Um, and Pinder heard me on overtime. I was doing the stuff about the Heat, and not really many people cover the Heat, and it's so it just turned into something that I could turn into an interesting niche and get on the air. It's a lot of fun. Cool. Well, that's why you're here today, to help us uh, talk about the Heat. But before we get there, let's recap the week that was for the Flames. And I think this is the only time we've ever had one game in a week. Like, this this just speaks to the abnormality of this uh, hockey season. I went back, I obviously didn't go back through all nine seasons, but I sort of browsed back through some seasons that we've been doing this. And yeah. I've never seen one game in a week before, except for... Like the like, last game of the season, I think. Yeah, or the season been. starts on a Sunday. Yeah. But... We've never had a whole week with one game right in the middle. So uh, this week, the Flames played one game. They played against the Jets and got spanked 4 nothing. <laughs> this clinched the Jets' playoff berth, and the shutout uh, ended a seven-game skid for them. So big win for them. Um, I would say par for the course for the Flames in this one. I don't know about you guys, but my kind of story of the game was just far too many giveaways for the Flames. I think those giveaways are what ended up sealing their fate. Yeah, it, it it was not a good performance. <laughs> Mike, what do you think of this one? I can't uh, I can't disagree. Uh, I I thought that the game, you know, I I only watched the first half of it. Um, it was emblematic of a lot of the issues that they've had under under Daryl Sutter. And I mean, I don't mind Daryl Sutter as a coach, but I don't think he is enough to you know turn around this sinking ship. Um, and I, you don't I, think he's enough turnaround turn around the singing ship this year or at all? Th- no, this year for sure. Um, at all, I mean, that remains to be seen. But this year, I think... You you know, say were... We could put you and Matt in a steel cage over this one. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think they, they had already taken on too much water before they hired Daryl. I think they had been a little bit too hesitant to change before that. And um, But, you know, it, it's just... It's just a frustrating season in a lot of ways, just how much they've given up um, to opponents that, you know, they, they really should be beating. Um, and it's hard to know what to do with Jacob Markstrom at this point um, because they're giving him a lot of starts. Um, and I think he's a better goalie than what he's shown this year. At the same time, he has not been enough to keep them in games enough on a consistent basis, I don't think. So Matt and I have asked this question. Do you think Markstrom's hurt? Like, he went down with that one-week injury. Do you think there's something nagging there that's still going on? Because he hasn't looked good since then. I think there's a lot of guys who are hurt, honestly. And uh, I think Markstrom definitely could be one. Um, you know, I, I think we're at the part of, this, part of the season where it's just, you know, they got to shut guys down. Um, they got to start seeing who they got. Uh, down below. Um, Matt and I have talked about that too. Probably the time if Markstrom's hurt, shut him down. I think Monahan's fighting something, shut him down. Yeah, I mean, with how much Chris Tanev battles through, I wouldn't be surprised if he's battling something. I mean, I, I don't I don't know, but it's yep. it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, I, I think, you know, we're at the part of the season where, and I, I, I've said this for quite a while now, even before this part of the season, but I, I think they need to start thinking more towards the future. Um, I think this window is going to be really difficult for them to win in. Uh, they're going to need, I mean, this season, they're, they're going to need this season to be, I think, the first step in a bit of a youth movement and a bit of a retool. They're going to need Connor Zary probably to come in next year and be a big part of their team, honestly, if they want to have any legs to this Kachuk window that they're trying to build. But uh, for now, I mean, I just think it's time to, for them to make that first step. 
So, you th- so you're thinking Zari on the NHL roster next year? I could see it. I mean, I, obviously he has to earn it. Um, he is a very, very skilled player. Really enjoyed watching him with the Heat this season, uh, tearing up the WHL again. Um, and he's got all the he's got all the attributes. I just I, he has to put it together, and I think he can. Yeah, and I think that frankly, like this whole team has, it's been one of those where, like, if guys like Kachuk and Monahan had been themselves throughout this season we're getting ready for game one of the playoffs but you can't have a roster where like if two guys have a down year then like your team is a lottery pick team like you well, know. I don't think it's been two guys either though name me no, a guy I know. that hasn't had a down year uh well Lindholm and Goudreau I think they've had good years for them you know like it, it's hard for them to put up the numbers that they're used to when basically they're the only guy on their line that's so actually doing dress anything. two had a good year then 16 guys with a bad year uh, yeah, I, I i thought the defense was pretty good for most of the year except for mm-hmm. asmus anderson but uh you know uh on the whole like it basically was the forward group that i feel is largely to blame but it doesn't help when you sign a whole bunch of guys that are supposed to be third fourth line filler guys and none of them play at an nhl level yeah like, i think one thing that we as a you know as a fan base and as a media group have maybe did not really thought of this year and we've heard it come out recently in, in different interviews i think elliot friedman talked about it in 31 thoughts a couple weeks ago but some of these players are just saying they're sick of their teammates at this point like more often than usual, these guys are together all the time. They're in the hotel. They can't go out anywhere. So you're seeing these guys every day. And I think that could be part of the reason that this team is not doing as well as they usually are. And Tree talked about this a little earlier in the season, too, that, you know, these guys have nothing to do. So they have a bad game. What do they do? They go home. And they sit there and they look at the wall and they think about the bad game. And they have nowhere to go out and let that out. And even in the past, teams would go out and do activities together or – guys that go out and do whatever they want to and now they have nothing to do but think about the hockey game so i i think that there's you know we're all living through this COVID time together but i think we have to think about how that's impacting these guys off the ice as well yeah they are um they they entered the season with depth that i think had easily exploitable holes and those holes have been exploited and as a result they're they they were relying on guys to take steps and become stars and Dylan Dubé didn't become a star and Sam Bennett didn't take another step and then he got traded and now he looks to have taken another step. Um, what can you do? Um, you know, Mangiapane basically, you know, took a small step forward, but not enough of a step probably. Um, they're, they are a team that has four bottom six wingers who are probably fourth liners at best looking at Lucic, Nordstrom, Ritchie, and Robinson, those shouldn't be your four NHL wingers if you're trying to, four bottom six NHL wingers if you're trying to make the playoffs. I mean, there's not enough skill there. And I I mean, it's just, it's a team that doesn't have enough upside um, throughout the lineup. They don't have the personnel to emulate that 2018-19 team that at times it almost felt like that team had four second lines playing in, in any given game, you know, with how good... You know, their fourth line was so skilled. Like, even a guy like Garnet Hathaway is leagues better than any of the bottom six wingers this Flames team currently has. And he was their probably the, their worst winger. They, well, he was better than Neil, but he was Matt's their favorite s- NHLer. He yeah. was, he was, yeah, he was their second worst winger that year. Uh, you know, Maggio yeah. Pani was on their fourth line. He was a guy who, who earned his spot. He was a guy who came up and looked fantastic. And they were a really good team when they called him up and they, they gave him that look, and he took it and ran with it. And they haven't done that this year. They haven't. They haven't been able to uh, open up any spots for guys to 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 earn their keep in the NHL. And as a result, it's just resulted in this this group of of, of depth players that is just that is just kind of stagnant and doesn't really seem to be pushing. Yeah, it reminds me quite a bit of uh, like the non-playoff againly years yeah like in like 2011 and such where like a group of guys that are pretty good but then like zero else well yeah. and i think that's been the flames mo for years we're good at assembling pieces we're not necessarily good at putting all the pieces in the right spot i mean even this year with you know levo and all these guys it's nhl guys guys that were available have some nhl experience but there's a glaring hole in the right side 
Mm-hmm. No kidding. And I mean, I think they have guys in the system who could potentially give that lineup some new dynamics. They have opted not to use them so far, which is interesting. Um, I think they, they have the tools to, to put together a lineup that would have qualified for maybe a playoff spot. Um, you know, it might be presumptuous to say that, but I think they could have given them, themselves a better shot rather than saddling themselves with some of the guys who they, they chose to use on multiple occasions. Like, how many games has Brett Ritchie played this year now? Like, 25? Like, and what? how many games of those has Brett Ritchie played higher than the fourth line? Yeah, way too many. Like, he's played on the Gaudreau line, like, for a lot yep. of the season. Um, and that, to me, just speaks volumes about this organization's priorities. Um, because that doesn't make a lot of sense in the present or for the future. So no, like, that. realistically, like, they should have brought up one of the skill guys, and if you're going to do that, like, whether it's Pedersen or Phillips or someone and stick them on that line and like who cares if it's a tiny line like you need to have skill with skill and you know like it, it because like if you're the defending team like realistically you don't even have to look at the third guy on that line it, no. defensively you're you just make sure Monaghan and Gaudreau are stuck not doing anything and then you shut that whole line down yeah you can basically triple team them Mm-hmm. Well, let's let's wait just a minute, and we'll talk about uh, some of those AHL guys. But let's wrap up this week first. After this week, the Calgary Flames now fall to sixth in the Scotia North Division. Gentlemen, Ottawa surpassed us. Yay! Yeah. Yay! And <laughs> depending on what happens in this next week, Calgary and Vancouver. Calgary's now sixth at forty-seven points. Vancouver's seventh at forty-three. Vancouver could surpass us. Good. Yay! <laughs> Good. I uh, hope yeah. they, I hope they get passed by everybody. Like that's yeah. that's seriously. I don't. I don't. There's nothing to be gained by by being ahead of those teams. No. At, at this rate, like honestly, you don't want to lose. But there's no benefit on either. You know, if they win, that's fine. But it as long as they finish in the top eight, because there are eight good draft pick players in this draft that you know as long as they're getting one of those guys at the end of the day it doesn't matter well and, but, and you can't even guarantee you'll get one being in the top eight i mean we've seen some weird stuff happen in the lottery the last couple of years oh i know it, it's just ridiculous and knowing the flames luck they'll f- they'll finish in the bottom eight and they'll they'll lottery themselves out yeah probably i hadn't realized they're already way down at 27th uh, yeah. for, for points. I mean, yeah. in fairness, the two teams directly ahead of them, Detroit and Columbus, their seasons are finished, um, and they have one more point each. Um, yeah. But, you know, with the way that the season has gone, I mean, as Five long as... Five-game losing streak. <laughs> yeah. As long as they continue to dress the same veterans, I would not care if they lost. Like, the, it's, it's only when they bring in guys who I think have potential future roles with the team that you know that's when i would start wanting to see guys you know putting together putting together games that are going to help the team win you know small small steps right but for now i mean there's just really nothing to get out of this team like there's nothing no. to gain from like what what is there to learn that is that you is know my what question. you know what you've got with yeah. the majority of this roster like you said mike there's nothing yeah. to gain we know what we've got let's bring some new guys up to get yeah. a look i, I just yeah. don't see much opportunity for learning from this current roster well, let's start there. We have five games left in the season. Mm-hmm. If you were, if Mike, if you, you're the guy who's looked at Stockton extensively this year, if you were uh, Daryl Sutter, you're trying to put together a lineup um, for your last five games, who would you be bringing up into your NHL lineup? Well, okay. So first of all, Glenn Godden's already here. Um, yeah, I'm not sure Glenn, if... Uh, Glenn yeah, Godden's he... expected to, to be in the starting lineup tonight on a line with Lucic and Richie. Yeah, so, oof, I don't envy him. But, um, you know, Glenn Godden, that's unfair. Milan Lucic just has, has had a decent season. Um, but, you know, um, Glenn Godden might not have been the first guy who I would have recalled. I think he would have been sort of down at the you know, number, number three, number four spot. He had an okay season. Do you think um, they're probably bringing him up because he's one of the more senior guys and they got to figure out what they've got there? I guess, um, like I, I, I could see this being sort of the test to determine whether they qualify him. Um, you know, because it's hard. He had a difficult season. He had four goals, um, thirteen points. He, he came on a little bit as the season ended, but 
he um, he definitely had his spot as the team's number one center stolen from him, and he almost even had his spot as the number two center stolen from him. Like he was a lot of the season. Like I would say he was probably their third best center. Um, you know, Adam Rosicka had a really good season, and he's the guy who I would say. Um, you know, impressed me the most in terms of surprising me. Like he, he, he made the biggest jump. I did not expect him to, to you know, lead the team in scoring. I maybe expected him to, you know, have 15 or so points. Instead, you know, he had 12 points over a stretch of four games. There, I mean, he had a really crazy stretch there. And the thing is, though, a lot of Rizicka's offense is driven by Matthew Phillips. Um, he is very much the finisher of a lot of Phillips's plays. Either way, those are two players who should definitely be up. Um, those Do you think the... you bring them up and put them together, see if they can totally. keep that magic going to the NHL level? Absolutely. I would keep those two together, put Mangiapane on the, on the other wing, and just see what they can do. Because, um, you know, Mangiapane is another really skilled player. You've already got Rizicka down the middle, and he's big. He's 6'4", I think. Uh, but he's also really skilled. He can shoot the puck like nobody nobody's business. He has a really good long reach, and he uses it to make really creative plays. Um, so him and Phillips, for sure. Luke Philp, probably. I would probably have recalled Luke Philp before Glenn Godden. Um, Philp was their most consistent player this season. Um, really, really good shot. Like, I would argue maybe even a better shot than Rizicka. Uh Right-handed shot, which, you know, the Flames don't have a lot of. The Heat have a ton of them. Um, and he's the guy who I probably would have brought up before I brought up Godden, but they've already see, seen Godden in the NHL, and they probably wanted to get more of a look, and he's been around longer. Um, so I can understand that. Either way, those four forwards for sure, those would be the four guys who I look at. It's interesting you're talking about Phillips and how he's really been the finisher for Rajeshka because back when um, Dylan Dubé was a full-time AHLer, we heard the same of those guys, right? And we even saw it in junior, Matt and I saw it in some of the scrimmages, and you were there too, Mike, at uh, at the rookie camp. Mm -hmm. And then we saw some of it uh, in the AHL as well, where you know Phillips and, and Dubé were the the guys that were pairing well together. So it really makes you wonder: is that Phillips's role? Is he just the setup man to the stars? Like, is he the guy that you can put him with anybody and he'll be able to set him up? Phillips is just such an extremely talented player. Um, I don't feel like he gets enough recognition as maybe one of the five most skilled players in that league. Um, wow. He makes plays out there that nobody else can make. Uh, he sees the ice tremendously. Um, he is agile. He doesn't get hit very much, um, which you know is a good thing to hear about a guy who's five seven. He's really elusive, um, and you know he just he can find guys with pucks so easily. Like they'll be on the other side of the ice, and he'll be pivoting, and then he'll all of a sudden send a pass, you know, two feet in the air that goes over two sticks and finds a guy right on the tape. You know, he's a really good power play guy, which would help the Flames a lot because their power play isn't that great. Um, he is, he is, you know, he was a treat to watch for most of this season. He's He's got ice in his veins. I mean, he scored a ton of really clutch goals late in games. Uh, you know, a couple overtime winners, I think. He was just, he was electric for a lot of the year. You know, you look at the stats and, and, and there was some, you know, he tapered off a little bit, but, you know, the entire team tapered off, like, the Heat went three fifteen and two down the stretch. It's really and hard they started to, really hot, if I remember. Super hot. They started eight two and zero, uh, yeah. and he was the reason. Like he was the number one reason they went eight two and zero. The like the amount of offense that he was creating during that eight game streak was unbelievable. He was so good. Yeah, and and uh, like you were saying, he's a right winger, center right winger, right shot. I think it's going to be tough to put together next year's lineup and not include Matthew Phillips at the NHL level. I can see a way they do it. I can see a way they lose him to Seattle. I don't know if I'm Seattle or that's the guy I take. Yeah, I mean, it's tricky, right? Because, you know, a guy a guy who has been such a prolific AHL producer, um, you know, they have a couple of options. You know, Phillips is basically the youngest guy who they could pick out of the Flames roster because he's just he just barely meets the criteria, having finished his third professional season. You know, for me, it's either Phillips or Shillington. Um, I, I I don't see really a ton of other guys. I think they signed Derek Ryan as a free agent, but um, then that after after that, I mean. But if I'm Seattle, I mean, just the opportunity to add a guy like Phillips even to my AHL team would be really interesting and then bringing them up. Yeah, I just think that there's enough guys like Phillips that 
can be acquired. I mean, we still have, we still have not seen Phillips at the NHL level, and That's I think right. if I'm Ron Francis, I'd rather take a guy that has had some NHL experience, like a Shillington, because um, I think even if you got to demote him, then he knows and he can help build those guys and show them what it takes to make it, you know, at the NHL level. Well, and to that point, then. Um that's why I could maybe see Phillips not playing in the final five games because they don't want to expose a guy to Seattle who That's they see now has NHL experience. Um, and they Would see you bring it. him up and put him on the taxi squad just to get him around this group? I mean, it's it's interesting, right? Because um, I, I think... I think that would be beneficial. Um, you know, he deserves, you know, the bonus, the NHL salary after the season that he's put together. Um, you know, I, I, you know, if the Seattle draft wasn't happening this summer, I would say absolutely get him in the lineup right now. Uh, get him, yeah. you know, see yeah. if he's a guy worth protecting. Well, and that's an honestly, point of why yeah. you wouldn't bring him up. Yeah. And honestly, like if uh, it wasn't for the expansion draft, I think Shillington plays all season instead yeah, of Nesterov. It's kind of like, oh, well, he sucks. See, we're not even playing him. You know, yeah. nothing to see here. Yes. It's weird. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, it's changed everybody's strategy, not just the Flames. Yeah, yeah. Uh, th- that's why, like, uh, I could see Seattle taking, like, Mark Giordano or Derek Ryan just due to the fact that, like, just from a value standpoint, that those assets are more than you know, the maybes that either Shillington or Phillips could become something for them. Well, you know, you know what? I was talking to one of my buddies the other day and we were talking about Seattle and the expansion draft. And the thing that, you know, we realized, cause I was maybe talking about the flames potentially exposing Michael Backlund or something because of his contract, something like that. And the point that was made, raised to me is, you know, if, if the flames were to expose a guy like Michael Backlund, he would probably be the best center Seattle has to pick. Oh yeah, like the number of centers that they have that teams are going to be putting on you know their their exposed lists, you know that's that's something that that leads me to believe well, that a guy like Derek Ryan will probably be the guy. I because, think though, Mike, if you wanted if you wanted to expose Backlund, you know he's going to get taken. I think that there's value to be had for that player. I think in, that in Tree would yeah, try to move yeah. him out. Yeah, and before honest, he'd expose him. yeah, and honestly, I think that like if you're going to expose Backlund, you might as well just. Pull, you know, pull up the stakes and go into a full rebuild because well, uh, realistically, who are the Flames centers exactly, next year? Right? Lind- Lindholm and then nobody because <laughs> like well, Monahan is not really. I I'm feeling that he's looking more like a second line winger now yeah, than a center and like the team doesn't really have anything else organizationally and expected to actually play wing tonight in Ottawa on the line with uh, Derek Ryan in the middle and Dylan Dubé on the other side mm. yeah yeah I mean yeah no I, I think Backlund could probably be traded I mean Matt I think you've stumbled upon my uh, my my greatest desire for what the Flames should do which is pull the plug um, and just go on a full youth movement um, because this is probably the best time to do it yeah um, considering some of the players who are coming up in future drafts. Yeah. But, I mean, I'm looking like shifting back to the heat a little bit. The heat had such an unsuccessful season and uh, like down the stretch going, you know, their final record was 11, 17, and two. And you just look at the roster that they had and the two best players, like two arguably of their best players weren't really eligible to be playing for them this season and only played, you know, a combined total of their 12 games like in Zary and, and Wolf. I mean, they were two of the more impressive players who I saw this season, and they're not ready yet. Like, they're not here. In terms of the guys who the Flames have sort of coming up on this wave of prospect development, it's thin. Like, it's really yeah. thin. And it's yeah, just... It, it, yeah, like Peltier, Azari, and Wolf, that's basically it right yeah, now. No and And then a whole bunch of long shot maybes that, you know, like yeah. if... <laughs> hoping... <laughs> Well, and, and I think especially when we look on the blue line, and this is the next question I was going to ask you, Mike, is if we're going to bring somebody up for the five games remaining on the blue line, you've got Kuznetsov, Carl Johan Lerby, and Alex Petrovic, and that's really, and I guess Colton Pullman, and that's it. Like, oh, I guess Yellison too. But, I mean, those are all guys that could fill in that number six, number seven role. 
We don't have a top, and you could argue we don't need a top D man now. We have enough young guys. We can sort of buy ourselves a few years, but yeah, things are thin on that blue line for the Flames. No kidding. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 things are really tough. And obviously, I think Connor Mackey should be getting in here um, because he's not Seattle eligible, and he's probably, I mean, he was their best defenseman for most of this season, no matter who he played with. Um, you know, very, very skilled uh, both ends. He was really starting to get involved in the offensive side of the game as the season progressed. But behind him, I mean, CJ Lurby, I really liked actually, um, especially offensively. I thought he was really skilled, but I don't know if he's in their future plans, to be honest with you. Um, I could see. I He's always felt like a guy who was signed to just be an AHL body. Yeah, I could, I can see a future where he goes back to Sweden this summer. Um, I can also see the future where uh, Alex Yellison goes back to Russia this summer. I believe there have been rumblings about both of them um, going back, not being qualified. Well, I think they might both be qualified to retain their rights for now, but I don't think either of them will be back next season. I'm not yeah. even sure if Poolman will be back, to be honest with you. He was not used as a regular. Like, he was... He was in the lineup, I think, probably the majority of the games, but he was frequently a scratch. Um, and so, and, and I think that's probably a piece, too, that we should point out here is we didn't have access to our ECHL affiliate. We couldn't just drop guys down to Kansas because of the border, sw- mm-hmm. you know, the border stuff. But I think, um, Mike, they probably would have put Pullman as a full-timer down in Kansas if they could have. Might have. Yeah, I, I could have seen it. Um, yeah, like... Next year, um, we're probably looking at, I mean, obviously, Johannes Schinval is coming over. He's going to be one to watch. Um, obviously, a really good offensive defenseman in the Swedish league. Um, but, you know, I think Mackey will be up in the NHL next year. I don't think Shillington's in the organization next year, um, just based on what's happened with him in years past. Um, so probably in the AHL, you're looking at Kuznetsov, Schinval, uh Ilya Solovyov and and whatever Petrovic style player they they bring in to fill the veteran role, or whoever they trade uh, Sean Monahan or Johnny Gaudreau for, if you get a defenseman there. Well, let's hope you're getting more than just that guy because yeah, we're getting kidding. an AHL defenseman from Monahan. We've yeah, we've crapped the bet on that trade. Well, you know, I mean, hopefully you could maybe get like a guy who's 19 and just coming into the yeah. AHL and who was like just a first round pick or something, like you know, an Eric Branstrom type mm-hmm. guy. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to gauge. The flames need depth everywhere. Every single position they need guys. They don't have enough. Like they really don't. And it's especially evident to the goaltending position where all of their hopes for the, the post Markstrom era are basically on one guy. Well, I'd say not even the post Markstrom era, but next year, I mean, we no longer have a backup. We traded David Riddick. Louis Domingue hasn't played hockey in what 16 or 18 months Forever. at the NHL level. So he's got a cooking channel. What ne- <laughs> What's that, Matt? He's got a cooking channel. <laughs> there you yeah. go. Well, wasn't it also uh, Riddick who did the Salt Bay thing, and that was yep. sort of the cooking guy from uh, That's right. from YouTube? So I guess all Flames Flames goaltenders have got to get into cooking. Yeah. Um, but I, I guess Mike, this is a great question here with the Heat. You've seen these goalies more than we have. Would you say that any of the Flames goaltenders, obviously you're not going to bring Wolf to the NHL next year. That's not a good development curve for him. So I think you've really got two guys here. You've got Parsons and you've got um, Zagadulin. Do you think either one of them becomes the backup behind Marks from next year or do the Flames have to go out and, and find somebody in the free agent market? Yeah, they will have to. Um, I think they'll have to bring in another goalie for sure. Um, I don't know if Zagadulin will even be back in the organization. I'm not sure if he, I think he might head back over to Russia. I'm not sure. Um, Another guy defecting back to Europe. Uh, yeah, there's going to be some turnover. I really think there will be. Um, Parsons, I think they will keep around. I'm not totally sure. It was it was an interesting year. I mean, he only got into the one game, and it was a difficult game for him. Um, Dustin Wolf, I can't say enough good things about him. Um, and obviously, if you look at the sort of the boxcar stats on hockey db for wolf you'll see he was 2-1-0 with an 895 save percentage and i think that's really misleading uh i mean it's obviously true but it's also misleading because if you saw you know the three games that he played the first game that he played he allowed five goals on 11 shots and all five of them were either deflections within three feet of his crease or terrible terrible turnovers right in front of his own net i would say none of the goals were on him um, like he had some of the worst luck I've ever seen for a goalie in his first pro game, you know, and it, it happens next game. Uh, the very first shot he sees Rob Hamilton, who is another guy who I don't think will be back next year. 
puck goes in off of his shin. Uh, shot was going like four feet wide, and it goes in. Uh, Hamilton's uh, an AHL contract, isn't that's he? That's right, yeah. Uh, and after that, uh, he stopped 62 of the next 64 shots he faced. He was fantastic. Like, the saves that he was making, he was darting across the crease. He was kicking out his pads to stop pucks that would have gone, you know, right over the goal line. He was – the agility and the – just the he, – he was he was electric. Like, just, just watching some of the saves he was making, he was really impressive. And I, I think had he continued in the AHL level, he would have become even more confident, uh, even more, you know, sort of – ready to make those reflexive saves that, you know, weren't, he wasn't really able to make right away. You know, like, I, I think if he had seen some of those shots that he faced in the first game, in, you know, maybe his third game, he would have made some really eye-popping saves because that was just sort of the level of play that he was reaching by his, you know, third game in the AHL. And, you know, third game in the AHL, he was making, like, 35 saves on 36 shots and blanking the Toronto Marlies, like, 7-1. So he was really good by the end of it there, and I would say he will probably be the starter for Stockton next. I season. think you're right. They'll probably keep Parsons around, but Parsons has played his best pro hockey at the ECHL level. That's I true. think the boat on him is a uh, probably an NHL regular here in Calgary sailed, but I can see keeping Parsons as the backup and making Wolf your starter in the AHL, and and I think that could be a decent tandem. The other thing with Parsons, he has yet to play a full season at mm-hmm. the pro level. Like This guy's always got something going on uh, injury-wise, whether it's mental, physical, whatever it might be. So yeah. I think that, that you know, is it's tough to evaluate a guy. when It's like Gillies. He didn't play a full season, I don't think, any of his years that he was in the Calgary system, and it's tough to evaluate a guy when you're not seeing a full year out of them. Yeah, well, they got Parsons back after a really long spell away from it because he was dealing with an ankle injury. He comes back, plays one game, and then he immediately gets food poisoning. Like, that was that was why he was not... He wasn't even dressed for the last four games of the year. Um, like, it was just the worst spell. And that one game, didn't he let in five goals? He let in five goals on 25 shots. I, I don't think they were... Like, they weren't... It wasn't like Dustin Wolf's first game where none of the goals were his fault. I would say there were a couple that were on him. I don't think he was as bad as that, like an 800 save percentage says, um, but he wasn't great. Um, you know, it was his first game in over a year. I'm really not inclined to, you know, to, to, you know, talk a whole bunch of Dewey about him. But you know, it's 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 hard to say with Tyler Parsons. Uh, he'll so be let back. me throw this. Let me throw this idea by both of you guys. What do you think the better AHL tandem is next year? Is it Wolf Parsons, or do you drop Parsons back to the ECHL? Resign Deming and run Wolf Deming. I'd actually rather keep uh, Zagadulin as the backup, and uh, if he drop, wants to stay, yeah, yeah I, I and would drop too. Parsons. I, agree with that. I think either way, Parsons being in the ECHL is the best for him. Just I just don't see Zagadulin start. wanting to stay in in America to play backup at the AHL level when he could probably go back home and be in, you know a starter in a higher league. It's hard to say. I, I think I think there is a an avenue for Zagadulin to go back and play you know twenty five games in the KHL and probably make a lot more money. Um, you like you look at well, I don't even know what his two way contract is here, but I would be surprised if he's making more than a hundred thousand uh, dollars at the AHL level, and I'm sure he could probably make more than that in Russia. And he's you know I think he's been good. Like I, I thought he was probably you know. Behind Wolf, he was probably their most impressive goalie, just on a consistent basis. I mean, Garrett Sparks was really up and down. Um, I thought Zagadulin was consistently pretty solid. Um, and I thought, you know, if in a pinch, you know, there have been a lot worse goalies, I think, who've played a lot of games in the NHL this year than Zagadulin. Like, you look at what Buffalo's getting into, you know, guys like Michael Hauser and, and Stefanos Lekas, you know, being there, that, that was their ECHL tandem last year, and that's been their NHL tandem. Zega Doolin's making 125 at 125K? the NHL. 125K? All right, yeah, that's a little bit better than I would have expected. But um, uh, although th- yeah. this isn't – is this his ELC still? Is is he – or did he resign? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. We'll see. It, it's one of those things that Zega Doolin, like, if necessary, like, we could – if depending on the makeup of the team next year, we could even make him the backup at the NHL level. And, like, if yeah, we're if going into a compete, rebuild – yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I would not have any issue with that because I think Zagadulin's the kind of guy who could maybe, you know, turn into another Dave Riddick on, on you. 
Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think if not Zagadulin, the Flames have been good about going to Europe and finding unsigned goaltenders. Zagadulin, um, you know, Riddick are the two that come to mind. Maybe there's somebody else that we don't know about that they're waiting to sign and waiting to, you know, get over the border there. So if Zags does go back, I think there's got to be one or two of those other guys that no one's heard of that we can bring over. Surprised you didn't mention Red O'Bara. Yeah. Well, we've already tried. Oh, yeah, that's right. Red O'Bara. What a legend. Yeah. Kung what? Fu goalie. Yeah. Although they tra- they traded for no, him, uh, that was the that wasn't uh, that wasn't uh, the kung fu goalie. That was Henrik Carlson. That's was right. Okay. Uh, yeah, the, the Calgary I, Tower. I'm getting I'm getting confused among the various foreign backups we've had in for a season. There have been a lot. Like there was Carlson yeah. and Red O'Bara, and obviously Kari Ramu was part of the Montreal trade. Um, yeah, a lot of guys. A lot of a lot of fun goalies. Calgary needs more fun goalies. Yeah. Um, so, Mike, while we're talking about this, and we're talking about guys that might come up for, you know, five games or less here in Calgary. What's the playoff situation? I, I guess Stockton, because they haven't looked great down the stretch, they're out of the playoff picture. But we've already heard the Calder Cup isn't happening. What's the playoff situation down there? Yeah, it, it's funny. Like, even if there would have been playoffs in the Canadian division, I'm not sure if Stockton would have been involved. Obviously, they started off the season last because they, they were the final team to get going in the Canadian division, and then they started 0-2. So they went from being fifth. Then they won their next eight, so they went into first. Then they lost eighteen of their or 17 of their next 20, and they finished fifth. So, it was so why such a streaky season? Roller coaster. I mean, there was not a lot of practice time. That's the thing. They had a really condensed schedule. Uh, they had a lot of time to prepare for their first games, and then once they sort of got into the swing of things, I think they were just getting out power, overpowered by teams that were a little bit better. Um, And so, as it turned out, the Canadian division wasn't doing playoffs anyway. Uh, They awarded a trophy uh, to Laval because they finished first in the Canadian division by a healthy margin. Um, Is it a trophy that was just made up for this year? No, I think it was a trophy that already existed. I don't remember the exact name of it. I can look back at the press release or something. The Scotia North AHL trophy? (laughs) Yeah. Um, the one division that I believe is doing the postseason is the California division, the West division. Um, they are doing some the sort one of playoff. Usually in. Um, I, I, now, I, I seem to remember like the Professional Hockey Players Association put out a statement saying they thought it was irresponsible to be doing those playoffs. Um, like the players didn't want it, and it was like the team's idea to do it. I'm not. I, I'm not under. I'm not sure of all the mechanics behind that, but all I can tell you is that the the Canadian division isn't doing playoffs at all. Well, it seems kind of silly to do playoffs if there's really nothing to win at the end. So yeah, the no winner of right? the one division that did playoffs. It's weird. It's yeah, like, it's yay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It, it's it strikes me as like a weird participation trophy type thing. It That's kind of what it seems like. Yeah, we're the we're the highest level of participants because we beat the other participants. Yeah, it's. I don't understand it. Anyway, um, so, I mean, you know, you were talking about not a lot of practice time, and I think maybe people don't realize that I think at the AHL level, and tell me what you think, Mike, the AHL level, that practice is so much more important, too. These are guys that are still learning how to play the pro game and learning how to play the, the style that the NHL team wants them to have. So we often hear at the NHL level, you don't have a lot of practice time and how it affects teams, but more so especially in the A, where these guys are, are there for development. The number one guy who I would say that impacted, I think, was Dmitry Zabgarodny. Um, I would have loved to see him sort of get a little bit more practice, get a little bit more comfortable with the team, because he took a long while to really get acclimated with the AHL level. Uh, finally started to come on near the end of the season. I thought he was a much improved player, started to look again like a legitimate prospect down the stretch. But they were trying to teach him different hockey than he was used to playing. Like, they, early in the season, he was routinely playing on a line with guys like Alex Gallant, uh, you know, playing really north-south tough hockey, um, simple hockey. And Zav is a really creative player. He is a really skilled and talented and elusive player, sort of in the, in the mold of Matthew Phillips in, in, in a few respects. And it was just totally different hockey for him. And he, eventually, later in the season, you know, he kept working at it, he eventually got put on a line with Phillips uh, down the stretch. And once he sort of got that opportunity, he looked again like the player that I thought he would be this season. But I just think they were trying to teach him new habits. But because there was not a lot of practice time earlier in the season, he ended up having to learn a lot of that during the games. Mm-hmm. Um, and it ended up being an environment for Zav Garadny, I think, where it was a lot of learning on the fly. 
and he did learn, and I think he became a much better player down the stretch, and I just, I really love watching Dmitry Zavgorodny play, because I think he can offer so much to the game when he's, when he's playing. Um, but it was it was a learning curve for him, and I think it was a learning curve for a lot of the players. They were a young team this year, a really young they, team. Like they probably- were, and, and you see guys like Zav Garodny too. Who I mean, in the in the junior leagues, he was in the QMJHL with uh, I think it was with Ramuski, but I'd have to double check that. That's right. Uh, you know, they they play one way, and their job is pretty much put the puck on Dimitri's stick, and he'll go score. Yeah. Right. And when we had Theo Fleury on the show with us a few years ago, he made a really interesting point, which was, you know, these guys now have to learn how to play a complete game because they're used to go out there, put the puck on net. When you don't have the puck on your stick, get off the ice. And now they have to learn how to get the puck on their stick. And I feel like what you're saying about Zav Garodny, that's probably part of that case there. Is they're trying to teach him to be a complete player without having that time to teach him that. Yeah, I think that's completely true. And Zav Garani, you know, maybe starting from a bit of a position backwards. I mean, um, obviously, he's one of the youngest guys on the team. He's not huge. Uh, he was playing in a really vaulted position with Ramuski playing on a line with Alexi Lafreniere. And he mm-hmm. goes from playing there to playing on, you know, a very different line at a professional level with, you know, guys who are really skilled defensively, who are really skilled maybe along the boards, playing, again, like a really simple north-south game. And it's just a totally different environment for him. And, you know, it's something that I really want to see him get more opportunities to, to, to show himself at next season because I think he'll be a lot more impactful on a consistent basis. I'm really excited to watch him next year. So Zav Garani is the guy you said you're excited for next year. Who else have sort of been the surprise standouts? Who are guys that maybe uh, you're looking forward to next year or maybe you were surprised that they – you think they took a step this year or you're really surprised by how good they already looked this year? The number one guy who occurs to me there is Marty Pospisil. Um, and I am really hopeful that Pospisil's back at 100% by the time next season starts. Uh, it was really scary uh, when he got hurt uh, halfway through the season. I was there. It was a game against the Laval Rocket. He had just been put on the first line because he was playing so well to start the year, particularly on the power play. Uh, he had 11 points in his first 13 games. He was really effective using the net front presence uh, that he has, you know, the, the physical body, you know, he's, he's a big guy. He really throws his weight around out there. He's a really unique prospect in the flame system. He's a guy who, if he makes it, I think the fans will really love him. Um, he's a really no nonsense player, you know, and, and it, it comes off the same when you're talking to him. He's just really focused on what he provides to the team. And he was you know, when the Flames drafted Pospisil, I was really skeptical. I was not sure what he was going to bring to the team. I thought, you know, I I was a little bit worried about how his offensive game would translate. And he, you know, I expected Pospisil, even at the AHL level, level, to be a winger. And this season, he was, he started the season as their number three center. And he was just feasting on his opponents. You know, he missed a lot of his rookie season, uh, 2019-20, after being concussed. Uh, in a fight and he came back this season and he looked you know no worse for wear whatsoever and then he got hurt uh knee on knee hit by laval rocket forward yannick veu got suspended four games because of it i thought he could have been suspended longer honestly when it happened i i was up there in the press box happened right in front of me and i i just you know it was just sickening like just watching that like it it just i thought he was going to be hurt i thought he was going to be done for a whole year like that's how bad I was really scared and uh talked to Martin after it happened and the sense is that it's probably not going to be as bad as some people feared I would expect him to be back for the start of next season um caught a bit you know like he was supposed to go in for shoulder surgery anyway uh when that hit happened so it looks like he might be able to you know recover from both of those things at once he had sort of a nagging shoulder issue and I couldn't tell like the way that he was skating and carrying the puck and shooting it. Um, he's a prospect who maybe some Flames fans don't realize is as good as he is. And I could see him being sort of a Michael Furlan type, but even maybe as a center uh, for this yeah. team down the road. What yeah. do you think his upside is in terms of where you might put him in a lineup? I don't know. Like, I, I think he could be very versatile. And Yeah, like uh, when he was drafted, like my main concern was like, because he seemed to be a little unhinged in terms of penalties <laughs> and yeah. uh, a little overwhelming on that aspect. But like there was a lot of tools there and it was like, can he learn how to control 
himself a little bit. And he has done a little bit of a better job with that. And it's one of those where, like, he could have a similar career path as of Michael Furland, as you mentioned, where he's a little bit all over the place and might find himself in a niche where he becomes a top six forward at the NHL level because he brings all of those other aspects, sort of like uh, how the Flames have been using Brett Ritchie. Where, but like with some actual skill to go along with it. <laughs> yeah. Do you guys think that with you know Sam Bennett now not in the organization and he sort of was looked at in the last year or so here as being that grit guy for the Flames? Do you think that could be um, sort of where we see possible a guy who's got some offensive upside, but really who's probably brought onto a team like you were saying Furland or you know like a, a Sam Bennett of really being that gritty guy who who uh, you're bringing into your lineup because he can do both and has both tools. I could see it. Like, the thing with Pospisil, um, he's he's a very unique player. I'm not sure if he'll ever be, you know, a driver of line at the NHL level, but when I was drafted, I was afraid that the Flames had, you know, picked another Hunter Smith. And he's not Hunter Smith. He's a way better skater. Um, I had concerns about his skating when he was first, you know, coming to development camps, but he could skate at the AHL level easily this season. He's got good hands, good shot. Uh, he's just a really poised player and um, I could see room for him like I, I, he's not obviously gonna play this season because he's hurt um, you know if, if Daryl want if Daryl fancies himself a guy in his lineup who brings size and who technically you know counts as a prospect I could see you know maybe an e2 Tuola sighting on the taxi squad at some point but you know in terms of a guy who has the most upside while being a physical prospect, I think it's got to be Pospisil. There's just Pospisil so much almost to seems like the guy to me who you could see brought in next year as the 13th forward. That maybe. guy you put in the lineup when you want some grit, but maybe isn't your everyday guy to start the season. My one issue with that is Pospisil, Pospisil has missed so much time lately, um, where I think you would want to at least start him with the Heat as an everyday player, for sure. Um, because obviously missing three months last season, missing the second half of this season, that's a lot of time to be on sidelines. And I, I think, you know, looking at his pro career in total, I think he's only played 34 AHL games um, if through two seasons, which, you know, obviously this season's been shortened, but still not a lot. I don't think he's even played half of his team's games. Uh, so I would like to see him get the, the start in the AHL next season. Maybe even, you know, looking at the centers that the Heat will have next year, maybe even their number one center off the hop. Um, we'll and see. I think that's important too. Like you're saying, he hasn't played a lot, and you got to make sure this guy's durable before you bring him up. I mean, exactly. we've seen a lot of guys that look good at the HL level, but they just can't string together two seasons. Yeah, I think Pospisil could be a guy who you know takes after Adam Rzichka and takes that step that I didn't expect. He's the guy who I could see being that guy as soon as next year. Maybe we see Emilio Peterson and Martin Pospisil on the same line. Uh, playing off each other on the top, but Peterson maybe moving around, distributing the puck. He's obviously got a lot of skill too. Um, you know, cooled off a little bit down the stretch this year, but a lot to like there. Those two on a line, maybe with Zav Gurodny on the right side, maybe that's your number one line for the Heat next year. Obviously, that's not even considering they have Connor Zary coming next year, Jacob Pelletier coming next year, Ryan Francis probably coming next year if he signs. It should be a lot of fun to watch the Heat next year because there's a lot of guys coming who will be of interest to prospect watchers uh, and to the Flames potentially in the future. Are they going to be better? I would say yes. Are they going to make the playoffs? I would say maybe. Um, they, they need to sign some more veterans, I think. This year their veteran contingent was relatively small. I think they need to make it a little bit bigger um, next season. So we'll see what they do. Um, anybody, you mentioned Glenn Godden earlier as a guy who, you know, really fell down the lineup from the number one to the number three. Anybody else who's, who you thought was really disappointing this year? Um, I might have liked to see, I mentioned Itu Tulola. I might like to see him take another step. Um, as it was, I think he had seven points this year, which, you know, wasn't fantastic for what I was hoping for Itu. I think he has another season left on his contract, so he'll need to have a, another good season. Uh, he'll need to have a bounce-back season. Because, you know, when he was a rookie in the AHL level, I think he had 20 points last season. Uh, so, yeah, him falling down to seven this year was a little bit of a disappointment. But we'll see. I, I don't I don't hate E2 Tulula as a prospect, but uh, I, I'm not sure I see it, you know, just in terms of how confident he is carrying the puck. I just don't see him being that type of guy at the NHL level. 
To me, E2 looks like a very generic prospect that every team, you know, probably has three or four of, and I'm not sure what his upside is. And he could be a guy that makes his living in the ECHL, AHL, that sort of thing, but I'm just not sure what the upside is in that player. Yeah, I think they're trying to give themselves maybe a bit of a do-over by signing Walker Dewar, um, who they got out of Mankato. Um, And he was a guy who I thought maybe struggled a little bit in his first little taste of action with the Heat. Obviously, first-year pro, that sometimes happens. I don't think he got many games. I think he got like five or six. Um, so we'll see what he does next season. Um, he's obviously entering the first year of his two-year ELC next season with the Flames. Uh, he'll be with the Heat for sure. And I'm not sure where he will slot in. But yeah, it's those physical guys. That's why Pospisil is still so intriguing to me is he has the physicality. He's probably the, you know, the, in terms of his physicality, he's probably the most you know, engaged guy on the team in that respect. But he also has the stats to back it up. And that's why I'm so intrigued by Pospisil, where a guy like Tulola or a guy like Dewar makes me wanting more a little bit. Makes sense. And, I mean, the nice thing about Tulola, too, we you talked about earlier, right shot, right wing. Mm-hmm. So that's a guy that Big. the Flames probably might give a little more rope to than maybe he deserves because they're yeah. short on those kind of players. Yeah, for sure. Um. Kale McLean, the coach down there. Matt and I have talked to him a few times. Seems like a really good guy. Seems like a really smart coach. We all know that he took over after Ryan Hushka came to Calgary. What's your assessment of Kale McLean as a as an AHL coach? Um, Kale is a really great interview, first and foremost. You know, talking to Kale, uh, I get a sense that he's a very cerebral coach, uh, very conversational, connects with his players, um, and I think I think he's done a really good job. Um, there are some player deployment. You know things that I have a couple of small quibbles with. I mean, I would have put Zav Garodny, you know, in a scoring role for for most of the season just to see what he can do and maybe try and get him some traction. They did that at the end of the season. They put him on a line with Matt Phillips, and those two just hit it off immediately together. And so that was a really good adjustment, I thought, by McLean near the end of the season. Um, you know, he he strikes me as a guy who really cares about his players and who really cares about putting them in the right spots for them to develop. Um, and I was impressed, honestly, just, just seeing the way that, that he conducted himself on the bench. Um, you know, he, he kept, he stuck by his guns, uh, even when the team was struggling. He kept, you know, he would keep Rzichka with Phillips for most of the season. Uh, you know, he changed that up, you know, a couple times, you know, just for small increments. But he was, you know, he, he was, he was always committed to playing his top guys in positions that would, you know, befit them well and that would enable them to continue developing in the right way. We saw it with Connor Mackey, who was always a fixture on the top pairing. And, you know, he sort of gave him that guidance and, and allowed him to jump up into the rush even more as the season went on. Uh, and that was something that Mackey even told us about that he was, you know, he was instructed to become more of an offensive player. And immediately after that happened, he started taking a lot more shots on goal. You know, he was taking four or five shots on goal in a game and he was starting to score a lot more. Um, I think the Heat organization as a whole is pretty well run. And um, I think that next season when when Kale has more options at his disposal, that will be the real test for him to make sure he can get the most out of that roster because he's done well in the past. This season was a bit of a blip on the radar. You know, maybe, uh, you know, maybe it's the start of a, a downward trend. I, I hope not. Um, but next year will be the test to see if he can use the options at his disposal to create a really successful team. Because I think he has the ability to do that, and I think he will have the pieces to do that. It's just a matter of whether everything all comes together. Well, and as you said, it's a blip on the radar, but looking back at former uh, Heat lineups, I think this is probably also the most underwhelming set of players we put on the ice. Good forwards, not a lot of defensemen. Um, you know, didn't have a lot of goaltending options. So I think it's probably a case of Kale doing the best of what he can. But is this a guy, if you were, you know, evaluating staff at the end of the year, Mike, it sounds like you would give him another year on his contract. Yeah, I would keep him around. Um, obviously, you know, this season is it's such a hard season to make any decisions based on, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's a weird environment for everybody. Um, I think Kale has done as good a job as he could. And I look at what he did in 2019-20 when the team went 30-17-8. And, and, you know, he had a few more options at his disposal that year. You know, I think a lot of things just, you know, went a little bit better that year. You know, he had, he, I think he did a lot of the same things. And I think the pieces just sort of fell in, in the right, 
the right places. Like the defense last, like in the 2019-20 season, you know, he had Corey Schooneman and Brandon Davidson for parts of that season, um, but no Connor Mackey. Uh, he had Shillington for three games. So I would maybe even argue the defense in that season was worse, and he made more out of it. And um, and that, that team was a lot more successful and would have made the playoffs if that season had continued. Um, so this season I don't think is enough for me to say, oh, Kale McLean should be gone. I think he has definitely earned at least one more look with this team. Plus it doesn't help that, like, just organizationally, like, the Flames are kind of in a transition period where, uh, like, there are only the larger portion of their good prospects are still in the junior level and or they're in the nhl like there's no real in between right now and it, it's kind of one of those situations where it, it's just a bad segment of time for the ahl team absolutely yeah and and Kale's a well-respected coach. He's had a lot of years at the ECHL level. I think the only reason you would see him moved is if he got promoted, sort of like Hushka, to a, an assistant coach job or got an NHL job somewhere. Yeah. Give it a couple of years. The defensive help is going to come. The Flames are going to draft a defenseman this year, guaranteed. Like, not in the first round, but at some point. They're going to draft a highly touted defenseman, maybe in the second round. You know, they're going to they're gonna bring in some defensive help. The Kale's going to have guys like Jeremy Poirier and even Jake Boltman coming to the Heat in a couple of years if they continue to develop. Uh, I mean, there's going to be help. And obviously the Flames haven't really given him, you know, the, the leeway. There was a lot made before this draft year that they had gone, I think, 17 consecutive picks or something without picking a defenseman. Like that's that, that to me that falls on Brad a little bit more than it falls on Kale. Because sure. you look at you look at his twenty nineteen and twenty eighteen drafts, and you know there's no defenseman here. Like there's none. Like he he didn't pick any. He was just picking guys like Lucas Fuke and Josh Nodler and and Milos Roman in the later rounds. He was just picking these forwards, and ultimately Nodler looks like a decent pick. Fuke looks like an okay ish pick. Roman wasn't signed. You know, they weren't taking any bets on defensemen at all. They were opting to sort of bring in guys like CJ Lurby on uh, AHL contracts who were already like 22 from overseas. And it's hard to sort of establish a sort of runway with those guys when they've already potentially developed a little bit over in Sweden. You know, it's hard to really establish that working relationship. And so what are you going to do? You know, it's, it's really hard for Kale to develop a good defensive core when it's not being supplemented by guys who are really highly touted on NHL draft picks. Um, and so that's a, that's a pivot point where I would like to see the Flames move towards drafting more defensemen yeah. because they've shown in the past when they, when they draft defensemen, they can identify good players. They just haven't done it. They had drafted mm -hmm. Adam Foss. Like they drafted Rasmus Anderson. They drafted Oliver Shillington. They've drafted good, good defensemen, uh, but they just haven't drafted enough of them. Yeah, and you look at, uh, like, this draft upcoming, like, if the Flames are selecting in the top eight, like, four of those players are defensemen. Yeah. And I, I wouldn't be surprised that, like, if the Flames are, say, picking sixth or seventh, that they do end up going the D-man route. Hey, imagine what the Heat might look like in a couple of years with Jeremy Poirier and Luke Hughes as the top pairing. Yeah. That could yeah. be a really interesting top pairing on a yeah. heat team in a couple of years or even brant clark you know like yeah. that that would be a good player like you know there's a lot of good options that that's why i think it's imperative the flames get a top eight pick one way or the other and yeah hopefully you know get somebody good out of it yeah mike you might not have this answer but if we're sort of telling the story of some of the trials and tribulations of the season um, this was a very quick move from Stockton to Calgary. If we all remember, it came together very quickly. Where were these guys living in Calgary? Were they all put up in a hotel? Did a lot of them find their own apartments? That's a question that's difficult for me to answer. I think a lot of them were in sort of hotel-type temporary living situations. I don't think a lot of these guys weren't nailed down here. That's for sure. Like, they weren't. It's not a situation where, you know, you have a team. You, you, you have a guy like, I don't know. Let's pick one. E2 Tulola starting a season in Stockton, and he's about to report for training camp in September, and he's going to maybe, maybe start trading down there in August, and he signs a lease that goes until the next June or July, 
because uh, he knows that you know if he makes the playoffs and the Heat go on a long run to the Calder Cup, his season might not be over until the middle of June. That's you know that's maybe a living situation that you might expect in a regular AHL season. Whereas the the Heat started in January, you know they might have there might have been guys who were already living here or you know started coming here in December. I think there were some guys who were arriving sort of late in 2020 um, with the expectation of sort of showing up for training camp, you know, training here and then maybe going down to Stockton if that's where it was going to happen. You know, I think we talked to a few guys who said they'd been here for a few months before the season started. Um, but at the end of the day, it was always going to be a shortened season. And I think it made a lot more sense for maybe guys to take up more temporary lodgings, um, you know, with the expectation of staying, you know, three months. It, like the, really, that's, that's how long the season was. It was a really short season, really short commitment. It was really condensed. And I think that's what maybe led to some of the guys having difficulty, you know, uh, assimilating into this organization, especially if it was their first season as a part of it. And that's why I brought it up. I think, you know, these guys didn't have a home. I mean, I can't imagine how, you know, I would feel if I was in a hotel for days I'm at home and then also on a hotel for days I'm on the road. Like, I can see why guys might not have had their best season down there or might have had a hard time assimilating. Well, and purely me speculating, purely me speculating, but a guy like Matthew Phillips is from Calgary, right? So maybe there's that added level of comfort for him that enables him to be more successful in a familiar environment, playing out of the saddle dome, you know, being the star player on a team in your uh, that's playing out of your hometown, that maybe contributes to him having a better season than comparably than some of the other guys on his team. And there's a lot of guys in this team from the States, from Europe. And I mean, those guys probably haven't even seen their family since the, you know, the, yeah. the season started. So Matthew Phillips, you know, having family, I know still in the Calgary area, you know, he's probably able to see them or, you know, if not be in the same room, see them from, you know, across the parking lot. So I can definitely see why Matthew Phillips is feeling more comfortable being here. Well, I'm talking about a guy like Emilio Peterson, who is, is no longer in Calgary. So I don't think we're going to see him recalled for the rest of the season, but He's over in Denmark now, um, playing for Team Norway at the Worlds. And so he's close to his home now. And, and that's just, I think he was saying to us that, you know, this is, this is we, we talked to him for the post-media day uh, on Friday. And he was just saying, you know, this is the first opportunity for him to be back home in quite some time. Um, and, you know, it's just, it's it's been such an unusual situation for all these guys. And, you know, it's it, it must have felt like, like a half commitment like going like it must feel so different for a guy like who's from norway or a guy who's from sweden leaving home after you know spending a summer there with the expectation oh yeah i'm gonna be over here for for nine months and it's just gonna be my life for that for that period of time but for a guy like i don't know a guy like emilio coming over for three months you know starting in january or whenever whenever it must have just felt like he was always just sort of on the cusp of being back and on the cusp of about to leave for somewhere and and, and not really nailed down. Like, I, I can't speak to it. Um, for me, uh, covering the team, being at the saddle room, it felt like it was over in a snap. Like, it felt like it was over super quickly uh, the whole season. And so I can't imagine how, how superfluous even this season must have felt for some of the guys who were still developing and having other priorities in their life with the pandemic going on. Like, it must have felt like, I don't know what the mental state around the team would have been. It would have been... Well, I don't know what you guys, but when I go on a trip, I love that feeling of coming home after and being in your own home and your own bed and not having a home to come to, I think, would mess with a lot of guys' heads. Yeah, absolutely. I mean... Going from one holiday into another holiday and is, you know, it's going to mess with you. Well, and the sense that I got with the team when they were traveling down the stretch and they were really struggling, 3.15 and 2 down the stretch... And I just got the sense that it was sort of a march. Like it was just a death march. It was just this this season that would never end in some respects. Like for me covering it, it felt like it was super quick. Uh, and I, I, I still get the sense it probably would have felt, you know. But I think near the end of the season, there might have even been, been a sense of, oh, I just. I want let's this just get over. this. Yeah. Let's just yeah. get this over with so we can go do something else. Anything yeah. else. Like, like I want this to be over and I want to go home. And I think that might have been the case. I, I I can't tell you. I know we talked to some guys, and there was a time near the end of the season where I, I asked one of the players what was the mood in the locker room. I don't remember who it was. It might have been Connor Mackey. And he said, it's okay. 
it's you know he sort he sort of he sort of gave me like a, a big pause and said you know uh it's it's okay and you know usually guys you know when you ask them questions like that they they, they say it's great i love to be here uh, you know, it's, it's, I'm really glad to, you know, get this opportunity to develop. And I get the sense that Mackie really enjoyed, you know, this season developing, but at the same time, when you were getting to the end of the season, that last five game series against the Manitoba Moose in their own barn, which, you know, has about 200 seats. It's this tiny little minor league hockey ring. Like that's where the Moose were playing out of this year was the Bell MTS Iceplex, uh, in rural, they're not rural, but suburban Winnipeg. Uh, because the, the the Jets were playing out of their NHL arena, which I think is usually the Jets practice facility. It is right? usually the Jets practice facility, and so the Moose were using this rink that looks like a rink that I played, you know, midget hockey in, um, and it, like it, it just wasn't. It just I just got the sense that it was a five game series at the end of the season against the Moose that they were ready to move on from, and mm. so you know that's it's tricky, right? Because they didn't they never really got entrenched in the middle of the season. You know, they got on that 8-2-0 stretch at the beginning of the season, and maybe that could have been something where they could have really dug deep into it and, and gotten, gotten you know, excited about the rest of the season. But from there, it just never materialized, right? They, 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 they lost a whole bunch of games right in a row. They lost a lot of guys in quick succession, too, which I feel it like can't be overstated. They lost Wolf to start the year after the fourth game. They lost Zary after the ninth game in the middle of a, a road trip in Winnipeg. Uh, they lost uh, Petrovic up to the taxi squad for a while. They lost uh, Marty Marty Pospisil to injury, which I feel really weighed on the team a little bit because that was a really, you know, it was a scary injury. Uh, they lost Justin Kirkland to injury. They lost a large contingent of their players. It was a really, you know, it was it was a it was a team in flux and a season in flux in the world in flux. And I feel like there's really not a lot more to say than that, other than maybe take this season with a grain of salt. And when you're saying they lost guys like, you know, Zari, Wolf, those were not to injury. Those are guys that should not have been in the AHL anyways. There's an exception made because of the junior year, and they just lost them back to junior hockey. Exactly. Um, you know, it was something that I said on my first hit with Pat Steinberg on 960, and that was right after they had lost Zari. And I, I thought they should have let them stay down there. Um, I thought that Zari probably had more to gain from playing the whole season with Stockton than playing out a schedule with Kelowna or Kamloops. Um, I, I think I think he would have been able to develop more and help the Heat uh, versus, you know, you know, heading back to, to Kamloops as a player who has already really proven what he can do at that level. Um, I, I thought he could have stayed with the Heat relatively easily and been an impact player and maybe even earned a call up to the Flames. But it's just the way that junior hockey works. You know, when the junior hockey season is on, you got to be there. Um, and obviously, it enabled a guy like Rory Cairns, who plays in the OHL with Sue, he was able to stick around the, the heat all season. I think he only got in four games, but that was an, an area where he was able to be around the team. I, I just thought it should have been the same with guys like Wolf and Zary, but it's hard. Well, and this is really the first time we've been able to see that, right? We've never had those AHL guys even be able to go to camp for the AHL, really. It's always been, you got to go back to junior. So maybe this year, Mike, it's the opening the AHL's eyes. And maybe the NHL, the AHL, and the Canadian League have to have a discussion about, hey, if you're an overager, maybe you can option your, you know, you option your way into the AHL. Or teams can bring one overager up to the AHL, you know, early every three years or something like that. The point that Pat made to me on the radio um, was that it hurts the CHL and it takes away their stars and it hurts their marketability. And I can see it. Uh, at the same time, there are always going to be the same number of jobs. Like, like it's it's yep. it's a case where you have guys who you know, even if you bring a new guy up to the AHL. That sends a guy down to the ECHL, which helps that league become more marketable. It brings a, le a guy up, maybe from the AJHL to the uh, a uh, to the W or yeah, the AJHL up to the WHL, and then that increases the room for a guy to make his mark in the AJHL. Uh, it, it gives more jobs to the WHL in terms of younger players being able to make their mark. It might reduce marketability in the short term for one specific WHL team, but I, I think there's a continuum that um, will still continue to function, even if you bring a guy like Zary up from Kamloops. You still have guys like, you, you still have guys like Logan Stankoven. And maybe that, you know, maybe that shows what Logan Stankoven can do with Kamloops. 
uh, playing as the driver of that team. Well, I was going to say, it can hurt you marketability-wise because you've lost your overage star, but it also gives someone else a chance to fill that role. Well, and it gives the chance to be the guy. Like, mm-hmm. a guy like Logan Stankoven uh, playing for Kamloops this year, um, his draft stock might be hurt just because of the fact that he's playing with Zary. Um, and sort of the reason maybe why a guy like Dmitry Zavgarodny fell so far in the queue or in the NHL draft when he was playing in the queue um, because he was playing with Lafreniere. And it's just the same thing, you know. Well, it's, it's just like uh, Andre Palat when uh, he was playing with Sean Couturier and he fell exactly. to the seventh round and yet Palat was a good player and has developed into a star player in Tampa Bay. And yeah. The WHL is a, is a funny league, right? Because it's a league that is in such constant flux that new stars become, uh, you know, come out of nowhere every year. And I think Zary is obviously a guy who the Blazers are able to market very easily. But at the same time, you know, they have a lot of good guys on that team. And there are guys who, you know, might come out of nowhere and turn into really good WHL players who guys, you know, flock to the arenas to watch. And it would maybe even set them up for a better draft pick in the future. There's a lot of a lot of different ways that that it could work. And I'm I'm not an expert on it. I'm a little biased because I wanted to see Zary with the with the Heat for the season. Um, I'm sure the Blazers media wanted to see Zary with the Blazers, and it worked out better for them. So works either way. I'm not sure. I would have loved to see Zary get a chance to develop more at the AHL. But what do you know? Yeah, we won't uh, we won't debate it necessarily right now about what that system could look like. But there's lots of ways you can make it manageable. Maybe there's a, a payment to that team for the player. Um, but it's funny when you guys are sort of mentioning the guys that you know maybe got passed over because of the star they played with. Um, going back to the Calgary lineup, Bill Arnold, right, the sidekick mm. to Goudreau in college, got signed here, played one game for the NHL uh, Flames, 61 games in Adirondack. 52 in Stockton, and he hasn't been heard from since. And another guy who probably looked a little better than he should have because he was playing with Johnny Hockey. Well, it's, it's just like another example of that. Uh, when Vincent LeCavalier was getting drafted, his line mate was Brad Richards. And Richards fell to the pick that, oddly enough, we sent them for uh, Jason Weimer, I do believe. And, mm-hmm. you know, and they took the flyer on his line mate. And, well, that came back to bite us in the ass a bit. <laughs> the funny thing about Bill Arnold is the Flames actually drafted him before they drafted Goudreau, both in terms of year and position. Yep. They drafted, uh, I believe, oh, no, 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 no. Goudreau was 104th overall and Arnold was 108th. 108th. So, like, they drafted, uh, they drafted him basically identical positions, but they drafted Arnold first which uh, sort of maybe lends a little bit of credence that maybe they drafted Goudreau because they liked what he was doing with Arnold as his center. Or I guess on the wing. I think he was, or was, I don't know where, I don't know what position he was playing on that line because I think Goudreau was playing with Kevin Hayes for a bit there. Yeah. Yeah. uh, Arnold was on the other side. Okay, there you go. Yeah. So maybe maybe they drafted maybe they drafted uh, Goudreau because they, uh, they thought he was piggybacking off Arnold a bit. Wouldn't that be funny? So one more question we'll ask you here before we wrap up our AHL discussion. Uh, and this one was sent to us uh, by someone on Twitter, by Jonathan T, at Journalism John on Twitter. He asked, what looked different in the style of play slash intensity when the Heat were on a long winning streak versus the long losing streaks? Yes, uh, Jer- Jonathan T, I've never heard of him. Uh, can't say enough about how I don't know who he is. Um, That's okay. So- yeah. <laughs> oh, he's. Uh, I'm sure he's out picking mushrooms somewhere right now. Uh, he's one of my old friends from Ottawa. Um, okay. So, uh, John, um, you know, the Heat when they were on their winning streak, it just looked like they were playing. You know, they were playing at a totally different level of competition. Um, they were they were playing with a ton of swagger and confidence, and uh, they immediately after that lost two players who I thought provided a lot of their swagger. And Pospisil was a guy who, who provided that team with a ton of swagger. Uh, I, they, I guess I would say they lost three players. Zary is a guy who, who, the way that he holds himself on the ice, he looks like a star out there. The way that he just skates and the way that he moves the puck, um, he does it with a lot of confidence. And he's a guy who you can just see when he's on the ice, he feels like he is one of the best players on the ice. And then... Even a guy like Alex Petrovic uh, was a huge cannon on their power play early in the season. Uh, he was the guy who was moving the puck really well in that power play, and it was something that I didn't 
know that he could do. Um, he was the key to their power play early on. He was the guy who would get the pucks to the net and put them in the right positions for Marty Pospisil to redirect them. He would put them on Phillips' stick. He would sort of draw guys towards him and then move it to an open space. He was really good. Um, and once they lost that swagger, they had to look to guys to try and fill it. And the guys they relied on more heavily were guys like Emilio Peterson, who wasn't quite ready for it. Uh, he was a guy who thrived as a rookie in a secondary role. But once he was sort of relied on to be the driver, he wasn't ready for it yet. Um, and don't get me wrong, I like Emilio a lot, and I'm really excited to watch him next season, but he's 20. He was a 20-year-old in the AHL, and he wasn't quite ready for the first line. And that's okay. Like, in terms of what he is as a development guy, he'll be there. And not brought, everybody can be a first-line player. Exactly. And they brought Glenn Godden back down to the AHL from the Flames. And Godden was coming off a stretch where he had played, you know, five minutes a night for the Flames um, for a few games there. And he had not found a ton of success. And he came down to the Heat, and it looked like he was trying to be the same player he was with the Heat that he was with the Flames instead of being the guy who was successful with the Heat. And he looked like he was trying to be a fourth-line checking center who wasn't trying to do too much that was fancy, uh, even when he has the skills to be a good AHL player. And we started to see him sort of get back into that as the season went along. Um, but Godden was not playing with a ton of confidence when he first got reassigned down. And so as a result, the Flames, you know, Byron Frames, I think, was still up with the Flames at that point. Uh, and so the Heat sort of had Rozichka as the center and he cooled off because Rozichka is notoriously inconsistent. Um, Rozichka, you know, when he's on, he's great. When he's off, he's not so good. Uh, and he was sort of in the midst of a lull and Godden was in a bit of a lull and it was just sort of a perfect storm of everything sort of falling apart. And you had Phillips who was playing, you know, pretty well, I thought, uh, but he didn't really have anybody to give the puck to who was going to do much with it. And on defense, Mackey was playing with Michael Stone for a bit there. And then Stone was back up with the Flames and Zach Leslie was on his pairing. And it wasn't as good as the Stone or the Petrovic pairings. And beyond that, it was a lot of question marks, a lot of question marks on defense. So in terms of the mindset, I think there was early in the season a belief that the team could do no wrong internally. And the interesting thing that I would like to say is we talked to some veteran players during the season and they just sort of expounded upon us the value of young players learning how to lose. Um, and I think the young players learned. I think they learned how to lose this year and this year and next year when they start to get into those losing you know, games, when they lose a game you know, four to one, I think they will be better able to come back the next game and win it five two. Whereas this year, as soon as they lost one game, they lost a ton in a row and they could not get out of that mindset of losing and that's something that i think will be really interesting to see how they approach it next year because that was their biggest struggle this year makes sense yeah yeah and that's you know everything you're describing here is really the development curve right all these things are just part of development. And it's interesting you mentioned a few times in this conversation losing guys to the taxi squad. That's another thing that's weird about this year that we normally wouldn't have. We had guys that were probably best served playing in the AHL who really weren't playing in either league because they were on this newly created thing called the taxi squad. So that was probably part of the issue uh, that we are seeing there as well with yeah. just some consistency on the lineup. Well, guys, I think we've probably covered about everything AHL-wise. Should we wrap this one up for the week? Sounds good to me. We've got uh, three games for the Flames this week. We have the Ottawa game tonight at 6 p.m. Mountain. We have a Thursday game, Vancouver, uh, 7 o'clock. And then we have an away game against Vancouver on the 16th. Time to be determined because, you know, these arenas are so busy, so heavily booked. We've got to find the right schedule for these guys. So three games in the next week. Um Let's let's talk. Oh, we should probably talk about last week. We had one easy prediction last week. I predicted a win. Matt predicted a loss. And Matt, you're finally on the Yay. board. It took <laughs> the, the Mike, one. Mike, you game. haven't been around for a prediction <laughs> game, but I'm uh, I'm up six one in this game against Matt. So yes, <laughs> I'm finally uh, off the board. Yay! <laughs> your, your shutout's over. <laughs> so Matt, since since you won, why don't you uh, uh, why don't you give us your predictions for this week? Loss, loss, loss. Three losses. Mike, what are you thinking? Uh, they're going to lose tonight, uh, and it will not be close. 
Uh, they will lose probably by 5 nothing or 6 nothing margin. I don't see them scoring more than Ooh. one goal tonight. I don't think they are capable of scoring more than one goal tonight, but we'll see. Uh, immediately after they lose tonight, they will be eliminated from the playoff contention and they will win all of their remaining games. <laughs> of course. Yeah. I'm going to go in a little bit of a different direction. I think they lose tonight. I think the three-day break, um, the team really figures, you know what, let's show people we can actually play some good games, and I think they'll win Thursday and lose to Vancouver and Vancouver's barn a week from today. That's that's fair. Last I, question I think, a lot. Oh, go oh, ahead. Yeah. Oh, yeah. well, I, I, what was the last question you were going to ask? Because I'm curious. Last question I was going to ask each of you is, how would you utilize Markstrom in the last five? Oh, okay. I'll, I'll start here. I wouldn't sure. play him single. I wouldn't play him a single game. Same what here. about you, man? Same here. Yeah. So I, if we look, if we look, um, Deming and Zaga Doolin are both here. Zag is on the uh, taxi squad, and Deming is your quote unquote backup. So what do you? So in that case, how do you break up the workload? I, I split them. I, I throw like four games Zag's way and one Deming. I would go. I think they'll probably go Markstrom tonight, um, but after that, I think it'll be two two. Interesting. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, the end is near. We're down to Yay. the last, uh, we'll call it two weeks of the season here. And then uh, whether or not we're allowed to golf, who knows what's going on with this COVID stuff. But uh, this is the time these guys usually pack up their stuff in garbage bags and hit the golf course. Should be fun. Yeah. Well, at least this year the Flames will have a good draft pick to look forward to. And, you know, something cool. interesting at least. And... Uh, you know it, it's like uh, this reminds me of like the 15 16 season where like everything fell apart that year uh, you know and like at the end of it i said well we're gonna get a good player out of it and we ended up getting matthew kachuk and we're going to get another impact player like a matthew kachuk regardless of you know as long as we're in the top eight so you know like yeah this whole season has been bad but we're gonna get a really good player out of the deal so you know, it sucks, but there's always a positive, and you know, yeah. Matt, yeah. you and I talked about this early on in the year too. Do you really want to be the team that wins the Stanley Cup in the season that will forever have an asterisk after it? Like, if there's going to be a season of bomb, this is probably the one. True. And you know, at least with this, um, and how thoroughly things have screwed up, like it, it's one of those that you can reset priorities in a lot of ways and you know like i touched on it a bit earlier with monahan being a winger and like even when he was drafted the player that he reminded me the most of was a uh normal speed version of patrick marlowe and marlowe for the first number of years in his career he was a center but then he eventually got shifted to left wing and played the rest of his career as a left winger and I think that after this season, I think you're going to see Sean Monaghan being permanently moved off of center and uh, make him a left winger as well. And, you know, uh, that's where, like, keeping Michael Backlund, I think, is a little more important if you're going to do that and transition and figure out a whole bunch of different things. Because that's just what we need, another left winger. Exactly. You know, we, we only have a couple, so, <laughs> you know. Just stack everybody on the left side. Nobody plays the right, and it's all good. <laughs> no, you, you could see this odd uh, face-off configuration. We have two guys on one side of the circle, nobody on the other. Just hope yep. you can get it over to both those guys. Yep. <laughs> I don't know. I, I would love to see Matt's reaction if the Flames traded their first-round pick this year for Patrick Line. Uh, I wouldn't mind that, actually. Yeah, I, I don't know what's going to go on there. Yeah. Well, and Mike, we'll talk more about this um, in the next couple of weeks on our show, but I have floated the idea, and we'll talk about when we do our draft preview. If we are in the top eight, are we better off to make that pick or move that pick? Because we've seen what Tree can do with picks. I would I would make it. I would make it. Definitely. Yeah. Um, I have one question, because we haven't really touched on the draft much at all. There is a goalie, uh, Lucas Wallstead, who's in the top eight. Mm -hmm. If the he is available... And with the Flames organizationally having bad goaltending for decades, basically, uh, do you throw a pick at Wallstead? Well, um, 
the better question might be who's the second best goalie because that's who the Flames would draft. But because yeah. um, I mean, I think they have Sebastian Kosa uh, of the Edmonton Oil Kings, who's also sort of up in that wheelhouse, but um, a little bit lower. But I mean, it's hard to say, right? Wallstead looks like the real deal. Um, if there's anybody who's going to be an impact goalie out of this draft, it might be him, you know? Um, it's just hard, you know, because they got Dustin Wolf, and it's, you know, it, Wolf, the only knock against him is that he was a seventh rounder and he's six feet. Uh, but but there's a lot of good goalies that are low picks. Ex- exactly right, and he's got the stats. Like at this point, Wolf's numbers are you know puts him in the upper echelon of goalie prospects in this league. I mean, with what he's done at the dub level, I mean nine thirty nine this year. Uh, you know, he, he, this is a guy who who if he if he's two shutouts back of the all time CHL record in forty fewer games. Like this is a guy who would just demolish that record if he had played a full season this year like he's you know arguably one of the best goalies in the whl has ever seen um so like i think with him coming up wallstead i mean it's hard if you can get another first maybe um if you can get another first in a trade for a gaudreau or for a monahan or for even a tradano maybe i mean it's it's maybe maybe you make that pick early on a goalie and then you go for a forward later or a defenseman later. I'm not sure. Um, it wouldn't be the worst idea. It wouldn't be. It wouldn't be like picking Mason McDonald's uh, in the second round again. I would not spend the first in this year's draft on the goalie. I think we've got to see what we have in Wolf. And I mean, we're not looking to fill a spot on thing in the next two years on say the NHL level anyway. So see what you got in Wolf and based on how he develops, look down the road to either, you know, bring that guy over from Europe or draft him or something like that. But I think there's more pressing needs right now. I agree. Well, guys, I think we're done. Matt, do you want to take us out? Well, as always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.